Welcome back, devotees of ancient religious studies. In this lecture, we continue to look at those who sought alternatives to the traditional religious model, those who criticized traditional religion and those who rejected the gods altogether. Atheism existed in the ancient world as it likely has in all ages. In our last lecture, we looked at the mysteries of Demeter at Eleusis, which, like the Delphic Oracle, was famous not just across Greece, but beyond Greece too, and was open to Greeks and foreigners alike. It was not required, however, to become an initiate, and the state took an active role in prosecuting those who profaned the mysteries. Worship of Dionysus was more suspect, but if Athens is any guide, there were ways to tame the intoxicating deity with more sober forms of worship. Athens celebrated Dionysus at some four festivals at various locations over multiple days in December and March. These festivals included songs and dances by choruses as well as dramatic performances. What we may think of primarily as entertainment grew out of a religious context, and the state took an active interest. It is a concern for any state to maintain social control, and Athens had an extensive and captivating religious program. But there were always malcontents. You may recall that for a right triangle, side A squared plus side B squared equal the hypotenuse, or C squared. This is the Pythagorean theorem many learned in high school geometry. Pythagoras, however, who lived in the 6th century BCE, was more than a mathematician. He was also a religious figure, and he was thought to have acquired his doctrines through travels in Egypt and the East, although none of this is satisfactorily documented. Pythagoras, who may have admitted women to his lectures, admitted only men to his clubs, not that this was unusual, and he was the leader of a society that required initiation, passwords, secret rites, a code of conduct, as well as adherence to Pythagorean doctrines. In a world where animal sacrifice was a central feature of conventional religion, they ate no meat. They abstained from beans, which was related to their belief in metempsychosis, or the transmigration of souls after death. Pythagoras is said to have recognized a friend once when he heard the yelps of a dog that was being beaten. But what does this have to do with beans, you ask impatiently? Beans, dear inquisitors, can cause flatulence, and the escaping gas may well represent the expulsion of a deceased spirit into the atmosphere through an unworthy orifice. May the gods forbid. There were other teachings. In his Metaphysics, Aristotle tells us about some ten pairs of Pythagorean opposites. The first item is good. The second, opposite item of the pair, is evil. Finite infinite, odd even, one many, right left, at rest in motion, straight curved, light darkness, square oblong, and of course, good evil. But truth be told, I've left the fifth pair out because I think that pair is telling about, the anci about ancient attitudes more generally. The omitted pair, male-female. Males are aligned with light and goodness, women with darkness and evil. Pythagoreans were obsessed with mathematics and music. They were vegetarians. Most did not join in public sacrifices or community feasting on sacred meat. They formed secret clubs that, in addition to theoretically inclined members obsessed with study, featured politicals, i.e. those who actively promoted aristocratic values, especially in the Greek cities of Italy, against current democratic tendencies. Their politics did not endear Pythagoreans to the people. In one incident, anti-Pythagoreans set fire to a house while a meeting was taking place. Pythagorean clubs were persecuted, they were suppressed, and they disappeared. Pythagorean theorems, on the other hand, still abide, but the principles of Pythagoras' religious teachings remain obscure. The fortunes of the followers of Orpheus presumably fared better. They focused not on this world, but the next. 
a bit of mythical background will help us follow the thread. Orpheus, a musician, was engaged to marry Eurydice. Alas, on the day of their wedding, a venomous snake bit and killed the bride. The groom could not be consoled, and he stopped at nothing to get his Eurydice back. Orpheus so loved Eurydice that he even harrowed hell. He talked and sang his way to the throne of Hades and Persephone, where he performed so movingly that they released Eurydice. There was one simple condition. Orpheus was not allowed to look back at Eurydice until they reached the light of the upper world. Well, dear students, what do you think? Did the man who harrowed hell follow directions? Of course not. He turned around, Eurydice was sucked back to the netherworld, and Orpheus was left bereft back on earth. According to the Roman poet Ovid, Orpheus longed, he begged in vain, to be allowed to cross the stream of Styx a second time. The ferryman repulsed him. Even so, for seven days he sat upon the bank unkempt and fasting, anguish, grief, and tears his nourishment, and he cursed hell's cruelty. Three years Orpheus held himself aloof from love of women, hurt perhaps by ill success or plighted troth, yet many a woman burned with passion for the bard, and many grieved at their repulse. It was Orpheus's lead that taught the folk of Thrace the love for tender boys, to pluck the buds, the brief springtime, with manhood still to come. This Ovidian version of Orpheus becomes a proselyte for same-sex relations, and more significantly, non-reproductive sex. Why? Heterosexual relations lead to reproduction, more life, more sex, and inevitably, more death. Orphix also believed in reincarnation, and their goal was both to avoid bringing more life and thus more death into this world and to avoid coming back to this world so full of grief and pain. Others tell us that Orphix were exhorted to refrain from sexual relations altogether, thus accomplishing the same purpose, avoid reproduction. To avoid reincarnation, Orphix were also buried with gold tablets called lamelli, which featured inscribed instructions for the next world. Especially crucial was the instruction not to drink from the river Lethe, whose waters erased all memory of one's past life. Like Pythagoreans, Orphix too avoided meat eating. Their doctrines were thus opposed to conventional religion which promoted fertility and childbirth, and communal feasting on the flesh of sacrificed animals. In addition to such alternative, or perhaps more accurately, inasmuch as polytheism was hardly ever an either-or proposition, additive religious practices, ancient Greek philosophers offered more thoroughgoing and rational critiques of traditional religion. Foremost among them was Plato, the Athenian philosopher who founded his philosophical school, the Academy, in 387 BCE. Plato's works feature Socrates as his spokesperson in dramatic dialogue, so it seems as if we speak incessantly of Socrates. But it is important to recall that Plato is the ventriloquist animating Socrates. Socrates wrote nothing. Other authors provide accounts of Socrates as well, and their representations of Socrates do not always align with Plato's. With that caveat, let us listen in briefly to a discussion between Socrates, Plato's Socrates, that is, and a young man called Euthyphro, who, according to Athenian law, which left prosecutions up to a self-policing citizenry, has brought his father up on charges of murder. This is unusual. Sons are not supposed to prosecute fathers. Sons are supposed to obey their fathers. Traditional morality says sons should help their fathers and hurt their fathers' enemies. Blood is, as even our own saying goes, thicker than water and often trumps the law. Euthyphro, however, believes that moral considerations obligate him to prosecute a crime, even if the perpetrator is his own father. This would be unusual anywhere. It was shocking in Athens. Socrates is impressed, and they begin a discussion of the sources of morality and ethics. 
Euthyphro believes that what he does is holy, sacred, or moral, because it is what the gods love. Socrates, on the other hand, wants to argue that what is sacred, holy, or moral does not enjoy that status from the fact that the gods, the gods love and approve it, but rather that what is sacred, holy, moral, ethical, enjoys that status from its own intrinsic nature. The gods, as beneficent and moral beings in their own right, naturally love what is, in itself, intrinsically moral. Or, as Socrates puts it to his young friend, just consider this question. Is that which is holy loved by the gods because it is holy, or is it holy because it is loved by the gods? To which Euthyphro, Euthyphro responds, I don't know what you mean, Socrates. Poor Euthyphro remains confused, but in the process, Plato, through Socrates, thoroughly undermines traditional religion by arguing that it is not up to the gods what is moral, ethical, or sacred, but that these values exist independently and do not depend on divine sanction. Plato undermines traditional religion even more thoroughly in his work, The Republic, which outlines the ideal city-state. There we read that the poets, who represent popular religious conceptions, tell lies about the gods. Plato cites these verses of Homer as egregiously false. The gods themselves are moved by prayers, and thus human beings, by means of sacrifice and soothing vows and incense and libation, influence divine will. This is why they pray whenever they have sinned and made transgression. Plato finds these verses of Homer reprehensible, why? Because Plato's gods are morally perfect. They are not susceptible to persuasion. Plato also singles out personal religious cults. Here again is Plato. And they produce a bushel of books of Musaeus and Orpheus, the offspring of the moon and of the muses, as they claim. And these books that they use in their rituals and make not only ordinary men, but states believe that there really are remissions of sins and purifications for deeds of injustice by means of sacrifice and pleasant sport for the living, and that there are also special rites for the deceased, which they call ceremonies, that deliver us from evils in that other world, while terrible things await those who have neglected to sacrifice. Plato's succinct list undermines just about everything that we have studied so far about traditional ancient religion in Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Greece. Again, why does Plato assert that prayers, sacrifices, and the rest have no efficacy? Because the gods are good, and they are not moved, according to Plato, by some sort of base commerce with human beings. The gods cannot be the source of evil. As Plato puts it, we must not accept from Homer or from any other poet the folly of such error as this about the gods, when Homer says, Zeus is dispenser alike of good and evil to mortals. How then to explain evil? Plato has an answer. The poem that contains the tale of Troy or anything else of the kind, we must either forbid them to say these woes are the work of God, or they must devise some such interpretation as we now require, and must declare that what God did was righteous and good, and they were benefited by their chastisement. Plato shifts to, we may note, from Homer's plural to the singular, God is good. Therefore, the evil that God inflicts is good perhaps in ways that we fail to appreciate. And in the end, Plato famously wishes to banish most poetry from his ideal state on the grounds that poets promulgate false belief about gods. There will be room for a little poetry, but as the Republic puts it, we can admit no poetry into our city save only hymns to the gods and the praises of good men. Poetry may only praise perfect gods. Were Socrates and Plato original in criticizing traditional religion? No. 
Fragments of earlier philosophers tell a similar story. About a century earlier, Xenophanes of Colophon, for example, wrote that Hesiod and Homer, quote, have attributed to the gods all things that are shameful and a reproach, thievery, adultery, and deception of each other. His sixth century contemporary, Heraclitus, criticized sacrifice. They purify themselves of blood by blood. They are crazy. As if one, having stepped into the mud, were to wash with mud. Furthermore, they pray to these statues as if one were to have a conversation with houses. There was already a long philosophical tradition that did not want to attribute base motives and evil deeds to gods. But this is, I think, a fascinating conundrum. If one insists that the gods are all good all the time, and one takes away their capacity for evil, as Socrates and Plato did so thoroughly, one renders traditional religion ridiculous. What need do the gods, immortal, morally perfect, have of sacrifices from us? Why should we make vows, pray, make deals, if the gods do not care about such things, if such commerce is base? If Socrates truly pursued such logic openly in the Athenian marketplace, the ancient Agora, attracting young, conservative, and wealthy aristocrats who aped his style and harangued the less wealthy and democratically inclined public, is it any surprise that the Athenian state executed Socrates on charges of corrupting the young by undermining traditional religion? The charges? Socrates is a wrongdoer because he corrupts the youth and he does not believe in the gods the state believes in, but in other new spiritual beings. Many have condemned the Athenians who sentenced Socrates to death, but the prevailing opinion in antiquity was that the state was justified. Relentless rational analysis of traditional religious beliefs and practices undermines a system that not only governs daily relations between human beings and divine forces, but also personal relationships through marriage vows, oaths and contracts, inheritance and property and more. In the poetry of Homer and Hesiod, as well as in the works of such later Roman authors as Ovid, we encounter gods who, like human beings, can be generally good or predominantly malign, at times constant, at others capricious and moody. Such gods explain, in an intuitively logical and thus satisfying way, a world that is likewise unpredictable, full of good and evil, justice and injustice. Such gods are exceedingly powerful, but human beings can, through prayers, vows, sacrifices, approach them, and if not procure favors, possibly at least keep their destructive anger at bay. What happens when both a supreme God and the gods more generally become morally perfect, without blemish, perfect arbiters of right and wrong, as well as, and this is the terrifying part, indifferent to our puny, laughable, and despicable efforts at bribery? Who becomes responsible for all that is wrong in human society? Many of the ills and much of the injustice we suffer, we inflict on ourselves. At all events, Athens protected traditional religious values. Socrates was condemned to death, and moral philosophy moved from the 5th century BCE Athenian Agora to Plato's Academy in the 4th century. Later varieties of Platonism moved toward monotheism, and would eventually find fertile ground in a new religion from Roman Judea. But that lay some centuries in the future. Even farther in the future, in 529 CE, the Christian Emperor Justinian will close permanently the philosophical schools of Athens on the grounds that those schools, dating back to the 4th century BCE, were pagan. Even though the philosophers of these schools had, for more than a thousand years, supplied the very critiques of paganism that early Christian fathers subsequently deployed so effectively against the adherents of traditional religion. History offers many ironies. After his teacher Plato's death, Aristotle left the academy and established his own school in a rented building outside town known as the Lyceum. 
Like his teacher, Aristotle dismisses traditional accounts of the gods, declaring in his metaphysics, how can gods who require nourishment be eternal? It is not worthwhile to consider seriously the subtleties of mythologists. Aristotle gives credit to his predecessors, Xenophanes and Parmenides, for identifying the unity of God and asserts that in his school, we hold then that God is a living being, eternal, most good, and therefore life and continuous eternal existence belong to God, for that is what God is. In this course, we focus on religion, but we may note that Aristotle's philosophy made fundamental contributions to logic, science, and the ethics of human conduct in this world, and thus represents yet another step away from the world of traditional Greek religion. Founded by Zeno, who came to Athens in 313 BCE, the Stoics, whose school was named after the Stoa Poikili, a many-colored or painted porch adjacent to the central market of Athens where Zeno taught, Zeno makes God the creator of the universe who had so perfectly arranged the machinery of this world that everything that happens is not only preordained by his foresight, but also preordained for the best, because how could a perfect God have decreed otherwise? Despite the predestination of our fates, we somehow retain free will, and our obligation is to cultivate inner virtue according to rational logic and to banish emotions, which tend to lead reason astray. The, the philosophy also promoted work in this world. Stoicism was popular among leaders of the ruling classes, especially after the Mediterranean became Roman. And one school of thought, founded by Pyrrho of Elis, yet another late 4th century, early 3rd century BCE philosopher, suspended belief altogether. This was skepticism. It was a school of thought that prevailed for a period in the academy founded by Plato. Some arguments, according to skeptic doctrine, could not be decided. Do the gods exist? Perhaps, perhaps not. Agnosticism and the suspension of judgment, at least in my opinion, are not as satisfying as conviction, especially in moments that require decisive action. It is easier to inspire others if one has a fixed doctrine and a determined purpose. Ancient skepticism faded in popularity, then enjoyed a revival in the first century BCE, only to fade again. A contemporary of the skeptic Pyrrho of Elis, Epicurus of Samos, bought a house in Athens around 306 BCE with a nice yard, where he would gather his students for discussions. The yard in his school became known as the garden. According to Epicurus, the world is made up of atoms and the gods whose existence he does not deny are, like us, combinations of atoms. But the gods take no interest in us or our world. Our job as human beings is to secure happiness in this life. But we should not do this as vulgar interpretations of Epicureanism might lead one to think by overeating or through wanton sexual indulgences. Indeed, such activities may bring transitory pleasures, but also disease, later pain, and lingering suffering. On the contrary, as one should by now expect from Greek moral philosophy, one ought instead to lead a life of sobriety and virtue in the pursuit of justice. Because the gods do not care about us, we are free to support each other. And when we die, we disappear with the dissolution of the atoms that came together to create us. We therefore need have no fear of death, which, as we shall see in our next lecture, motivates a great deal of traditional religious practices. Declaring that the gods are merely combinations of atoms that take no interest in the world that we inhabit is, in essence, atheism. The best account of Epicurean philosophy that we have was composed by the first century BCE Roman poet Lucretius in his didactic poem De Rerum Natura, or in English, On the Nature of Things. Lucretius gives us a full account not only of atomistic theory, but also a sustained attack on religion as a source of crime and human misery. 
Lucretius begins with traditional philosophical criticism of the gods' need for sacrifices. Of all the examples he might have chosen, Lucretius highlights the human sacrifice that Artemis enjoined when she compelled Agamemnon to sacrifice his own daughter Iphigenia in order to procure the winds he needed for the Greek fleet to reach Troy. A parent felled her on her wedding day, making his child a sacrificial beast to give the ships auspicious winds for Troy. Such are the crimes to which religion leads. Lucretius does not just criticize traditional religion. He dismisses religion altogether as an incitement to crime. Although Roman Lucretius gives due credit to Greek philosophy, a Greek it was who first opposing dared raise mortal eyes to withstand the terror of religion, whom neither the fame of gods nor lightning strike nor threatening thunder of the ominous sky abashed. And we find that Lucretius leaves a little bit of room for the old gods, but only as metaphors. And here, those who decide to call the ocean Neptune or the grain crop series, let us permit them to go on calling the earth mother of gods, if only they will spare to taint their souls with foul religion. We may suppose that there have always existed in varying proportions in any population, the devout, the moderately religious, skeptics and atheists. How robust or numerous each group may be in any given age depends on the spirit of that age, as well as the law. To profess atheism under a communist regime was, of course, easier than espousing atheism in public in the United States. Conversely, public professions of devout faith carry less social cost in some societies than in others, especially if one professes the prevailing faith. And truth be told, there are opportunists. Are politicians truly as devout as they profess in their public speeches? We are fortunate to possess many works of the first century BCE politician Cicero. Both his public speeches, in which he professed the greatest reverence for Rome's traditional gods, and his philosophical speculations on the nature of the gods, where he expressed great skepticism. This makes sense, of course. The politician of the ruling class expresses in public what he knows will be effective with his less educated but more devout audience. And without an internet or television cameras or radio or even newspapers to make his philosophical speculations go viral, Cicero was safe to publish his phil philosophical speculations, knowing that they would never circulate widely. In literature, enemies are also depicted as godless. One of the greatest antagonists of ancient epic is one Mezentius, whose epithet in Virgil's Aeneid is contemptor deum, scorner of the gods. This hopeless atheist opposes the hero Pius Aeneas, whose epithet Pius, although it bequeaths the word pious to English, does not imply quiet devotion. Pius, in Latin, is what a soldier felt toward his general when obeying a command. We may render Pius as religiously steadfast and aggressively loyal. Atheists rarely get good press. But if we leave behind the ruling classes and the literature of the few, and instead contemplate the attitudes of the many. And if those ancient many were like their descendants, they most likely did not join strange cults or concern themselves with the distinctions of the competing philosophical schools. And in the illiterate countryside where most of the many lived, such competing doctrines remained distant indeed. Most of these people likely showed up for traditional, customary, and ancestral rituals out of habit. And this group represents part of the power of ancestral religion. Who can be bothered to switch religions? How popular, then, were deviant cults, the various philosophical schools, or atheism in the ancient world? We have no statistics. There was a sharp distinction between the literate ruling classes of cities and the majority 
who lived in the countryside. Pagos, or countryside, as you may recall, was the Latin word from which early Christians derived their insulting term pagani, or pagans, the people who held on to their ancestral religions the longest. It is important to note here, however, that well before Christianity and among the literate ruling classes, we read in their speculative philosophy about gods and a supreme god who are morally perfect and good, or perhaps remote, or even non-existent, but more importantly, perfectly good and benevolent. Over the centuries, this idea of morally good and benevolent gods will wreak havoc on traditional beliefs. In short, ancient religion was never monolithic, and we can still hear the echoes of the diverse views that existed in their distant world. Alas, dear devotees of ancient cults and philosophical speculations, we have run out of time. But, and this is the good news, we have not run out of material. In our next lecture, we turn to the fate of the dead according to traditional Greek views, as well as the ceremonial requirements placed on their bereft survivors. Until then, may your studies as well as your nights and days be auspicious. <laughs>